Carl Icahn is one of the most recognisable and successful investors in the world, having far outperformed the market on an annualised basis since 1968, at a rate which by some measures has him ahead of Warren Buffett. Though his corporate raider or activist approach to investing has proven to be controversial at times, with Icahn being no stranger to the glare of the world's financial media, his involvement in companies has still resulted in a boost for shareholders more often than not, leading to the so-called Icahn effect in stock prices whenever he announces a position. Whether you love him or hate him, the man Time Magazine called the master of the universe and the most important investor in America is definitely someone to be respected and studied. This is his story. Carl Icahn was born on the 16th of February 1936 in Queens, New York. It was a beach neighbourhood and a poor area. His mother was a pianist, but dropped her dreams of pursuing it as a career and instead chose a more stable job as a school teacher. His father also became a substitute teacher as well. As you may expect with both parents being involved in education, Carl was extremely studious. At high school, he didn't involve himself in many activities such as sports and clubs, Instead, he had set himself the big goal of making it to an Ivy League university, something most people in his area had no chance of doing. His teacher didn't even think it was worth him applying, but this made him even more determined to be different. He had a mindset that he wanted to be the best at everything. His parents said they would only pay for university if he managed to get into one of the top Ivy League universities. Although no one thought he stood a chance, he did manage to enroll at Princeton University and studied philosophy as his major. My father said, you know, son, I'm thinking about you, and I'm not going to go back on my word. I'd rather you go to Queens College, you know, because Queens was free. But if you insist on going to Princeton, we decided we'll pay the tuition. I said, great, thanks, Dad. I really appreciate it. But not the room and board. So I said, well, wait a minute. Well, how do I live? How do I eat? He said, you're a smart kid. I've watched you. You'll figure it out. So to fund this, Carl got himself a summer job at a club in his neighborhood. Whilst he was there, he learned how to play poker and joined in the games regularly. He says at the start, he didn't even know how to play, but then he read three poker books in two weeks and became the best player there, taking home huge winnings every summer. He says, to me, it was a big game, big stakes. Every summer I won about $2,000, which was like $50,000 back in the 50s. Just like in high school, at Princeton, Icahn wasn't interested in any extracurricular activities or socializing. Instead, he'd spend the majority of his time in his room or at the library reading books and studying philosophy, only occasionally getting involved in games of chess or a bit of volleyball. He was basically described as a nerd and didn't want to participate in much. He just wanted to spend more time broadening his mind and taking his thoughts to another level. At university, he won an award for his thesis, an explication of the empiricist criterion of meaning, and has always said that his study of philosophy had a massive effect on him and the way he built his way up to where he is today. He said, Empiricism says knowledge is based on observation and experience, not feelings. In a funny way, studying 20th century philosophy trains your mind for takeovers. There's a strategy behind everything, everything fits. Thinking this way taught me to compete in many things, not only takeovers, but chess and arbitrage. He graduated from Princeton in 1957, earning himself a degree in philosophy, and then moved on to medical school at the New York University School of Medicine. He attended because it's what his mum wanted him to do, but after two years, he decided to leave as he realized he just wasn't interested in it. He said to CNN in an interview, one of the greatest things I did for the human race was not to become a doctor. Ironically, a medical school was named after him in 2012. After dropping out of medical school, Icahn still had no idea what he wanted to do with his life. He went to the army for a little while and then decided to get in touch with his uncle who worked on Wall Street. He managed to secure a job as a stockbroker for Dreyfus & Co in 1961. At this time, the markets were in a strong bull market but were soon to experience a crash. It was at this point that Icahn realized the best choice for him would be to focus on the options market. 
He began working for Tessel, Patrick & Co in 1963 as an options manager and then went on to Gruntel & Co the following year, where he took over the options department. A few years later in 1968, Icahn decided it was time to start up on his own and approached his uncle again for support. His uncle lent him the money to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange for $400,000 and that year, he formed Icahn & Co. The company mainly specialized in options trading as well as risk arbitrage. Icahn & Co did very well and Icahn claims they started to make $1.5 million to $2 million per year. Although there are no public records to state how much they earned, it is thought that they were worth over $100 million by the 1980s. Although Icahn made significant returns in options trading and risk arbitrage, it was his role as a corporate raider or activist investor that really earned him his reputation and extreme levels of wealth. This began in 1978 when Icahn started to take large positions in single companies to have more control. A corporate raid is when a trader buys a large amount of shares, therefore gaining more rights within the company including voting rights, which enables them to push specific changes which could then increase the share prices. They may also push to change the board of directors or management, leading to them being able to influence other major changes such as corporate takeovers or stock sales. The first company he did this with was Tappan & Co. Icahn bought a huge number of shares in the company, so large that the company owner, Dick Tappan, called him personally. However, Icahn was demanding a seat on the board and was very persistent in this request. Eventually, out of fear that Icahn would take over the company and sell parts off, the owner of Tappan & Co found another buyer. Although this was not an absolute defeat for Icahn, since his original investment made around $2.7 million. Icahn gained a reputation as a corporate raider and for his hostile takeovers, with people criticizing his approach of bullying his way to company takeovers. Many city executives came to dislike him, with one M&A chief saying, Carl's dream in life is to have the only fire truck in town. Then, when your house is in flames, he can hold you up for every penny you have. He continued to take over more companies in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and in 1985 he attempted to take over Philips Petroleum. However, the board used a poison pill to stop the takeover. A poison pill is a tactic used by companies to prevent a hostile takeover from taking place. These are usually provisions the board agrees to, which makes the acquisition of shares less desirable. In this case, Icahn sold his shares back to the company, earning $50 million in the process. One of the biggest and most public takeovers was of Transworld Airlines, TWA, later that same year. Icahn bought a large stake in the company. He knew they were not doing well, so he knew he could get them for cheaper as the company was in debt of $1 billion. TWA tried everything they could to stop him from buying more shares and taking over the company, even searching for another airline to acquire them. However, Icahn succeeded and took over the company for $800 million and making himself CEO in the process. As expected, this move wasn't just plain sailing, as the company wasn't actually doing very well. Icahn had already sold off assets to pay back the money he borrowed to buy into the company and in 1988 he took the airline private. The company declared bankruptcy in 1991 after selling half of its London routes to another airline and Icahn resigned as chairman. Icahn continued to buy large amounts of shares in companies in an attempt to take over the companies. Some of them were proved to be successful and some unsuccessful, such as his attempts on US Steel and Texaco. He didn't manage to take over either of those companies, but he still made huge profits through the process. His approach to investing is to always look for companies that are trading below their value and to invest in them. In many cases, there will be some changes that need to be made to ensure their future success. This is where Icahn has earned his title as an activist investor, as an activist investor uses their stake in a company to apply pressure to management to enact changes. In many cases, this will involve a change in the top management, and Icahn has been very vocal in complaining about the state of management around the world today, and believes changes in management can often be the key to success. 
Although this activist approach is not achievable for many smaller or private investors, there are still some key lessons for all investors in order to emulate ICANN's approach to a certain extent. This falls into two very key criteria. You should look for companies that are potential value plays. In other words, they are not trading at their current or potential value. And then the company must have good management that is working on behalf of shareholders. Neither of these points are straightforward at all to achieve, but certain companies will come along that stand out above all others, particularly due to their management. Icon typically goes long in equities, and The Motley Fool found that his typical holding period is no more than 18 months, therefore making him more of a short-term minded investor or trader rather than a long-term holder. He also likes to be very focused on his opportunities, with more than 50% of his portfolio comprising of just three stocks at certain points in time. Although this does make him very exposed to the stock market and particular stocks, he does also claim to be hedged when there are times of uncertainty. In recent years, he's announced in interviews that he was heavily hedged in his portfolio against the downturn with the use of derivatives at times. Yeah, I'm really hedged. So what are you hedge? You're hedging the index? Yeah, options? yeah, you're making a good point. It, it, it's it's difficult to really do a great job hedging because we got these long positions. And I tell you, there's ways to hedge, and this is where you do these derivatives. Although he finds it difficult to hedge against certain stocks such as Apple, which he actually no longer has a holding in, instead with companies like that, he assumes that they will weather the storm and will actually take a downturn as a buying opportunity instead to acquire more stock at a lower price. I, with Apple, you can't really hedge it that much, but I feel so secure with Apple, you know, maybe I hope I'm not gonna be wrong, that if it goes down, I just buy more, so I don't worry. It's clear from interviews that although Icon is focused on individual equities, he does keep a close view on the macro environment and key significant variables from other asset classes. In 2004, Icon started a new firm called Icon Partners. He did this through investors and managed to raise $3 billion. By 2007, the fund was worth $5 billion. He bought a large amount of shares in big companies like Blockbuster Video and also threatened proxy fights with companies in order to get what he wanted. One example of this was when Mylan Laboratories was in the process of acquiring King Pharmaceuticals. Icahn bought a large amount of shares and threatened a proxy fight until Mylan Laboratories backed down. The 2008 financial crisis meant that Icahn had to sell a lot of his shares, including those of Blockbuster Video, at a huge loss of $180 million. He went on to return money to investors in 2011. In recent years, Icahn has made the headlines in a few different cases. In 2012, he attempted to acquire a large stake in Netflix, which deterred him through the use of a poison pill, although he still made $1.9 billion on his holding. He had a holding in Apple, which eventually reached nearly $5 billion, which he sold in 2016. And a notable rivalry with another activist investor, Bill Ackman, led to Icahn taking a large stake in Herbalife to oppose Ackman's famous short sale. This led to an ongoing feud that made the financial headlines for a number of years, although the two have supposedly called a truce. And more recently, Icahn was hired and subsequently stepped down as a special advisor to President Trump on regulatory reform. At the time of releasing this video, Icahn has a net worth of nearly $17 billion. Although he claims not to have the time to spend it, he has been involved in many charitable initiatives. Do you live a glamorous life? I'd say no. Absolutely not. Yeah, Gail yeah, says yeah. they have little time to enjoy the money he's made. So how do they spend their money? More and more on philanthropy, like building this track and field stadium for the school children of New York City and building two charter schools in poor neighborhoods in the Bronx. It's clear that very few investors have or ever will reach the level of success that Carl Icahn has achieved with his unique and intense approach to investing. And although most people can't take his blueprint for success and apply it directly due to a lack of capital, it is still possible to take the key points from his investment philosophy as outlined in this video and to use it to enhance the way that you assess investments. If you like this video, you may want to check out our previous episode on the famous trader Paul Tudor Jones. 
hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying this series and would like to see more Legends of Trading and Investing and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of them in the future. Thanks a lot for watching, take care.